All right, welcome everybody. And uh, I think in many cases I'll say welcome back because I see a number of faces that we've seen in previous years and haven't seen in the Dragon in quite some time. So we're thrilled to have you all back. Um, also, it's very exciting that we are launching the 22nd year of, Wish, of the Wish You Were Here series. We first started back in 2001, and it was first conceived and supported by longtime, very generous member Tom Tischer, who is actually with us in the front row. So thank you, Tom. As I share, the irony sometimes is that Tom is such an avid traveler that we aren't always able to find dates that work for him to be here for this series. So it's always um, an accomplishment when we actually have Tom with us today. Um, and please mark your calendar for our upcoming talks uh, with Martha Cooper on October 27th and Ed Cashy on November 17th. And it's exciting to welcome Anastasia Samoylova back. Um, she shared work from a previous project in a Wish You Were Here talk in 2018. Um, and some of that work is the basis for her current exhibition, Flood Zone. And this talk is extremely timely um, with Hurricane Ian um, working its way now also as a tropical storm across Florida. Um, and we're relieved that Anastasia got out safely on uh, one of the last flights or last seat on a flight out on Monday. And those that have been impacted by Ian are, and are in the current um, path are in our thoughts as we speak tonight. Um, Anastasia's work, Flood Zone, focuses on the southern United States and explores what it is to live at the edge of climate change and the impact of rising sea levels and hurricanes. As I said, extremely timely conversation tonight. Uh, she has a master's from the Russian State University for the Humanities and a master in fine arts from Bradley University. Um, as an artist, Anastasia moves between observational photography and studio practice. Her work explores notions of environmentalism, consumerism, and the picturesque. Her recent exhibitions include the Chrysler Museum of Art, the Photographer's Gallery in London, Kunsthaus Wien in Austria, History Miami Museum, Museum of Fine Arts Le Loco in Switzerland, and of course, the Eastman Museum. And in 2022, she was shortlisted for the Deutsche Bors Photography Foundation Prize. And her work is in the collections at the Perez Art Museum Miami and Museum of Contemporary Photography Chicago, among others. Her published monographs include Florida's and Flood Zone, both by Steidel. And tonight's conversation will be followed by a book signing the Potter Peristyle of the book Flood Zone. So we have this available down in the Peristyle for purchase. And the exhibition will also be open for viewing tonight. And the presentation of Flood Zone here at the museum is generously sponsored by the Rubens Family Foundation with support um, from Nick and Susan Rob Fogel. So thank you. Our format for tonight's talk is a bit different. Um, Anastasia will be joined by Jamie Allen, the Stephen B. and Janice G. Ashley Curator and Interim Head of Department of Photography for a conversation about Anastasia's work. Um, please join me in welcoming Anastasia Samoylova back to George Eastman Museum. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. It feels like it's been so long since we've been here in person. So it's great to have people here in the Dryden. Um, I am very excited to get to have a conversation with Anastasia. This is a conversation that we've had now for a couple of years ongoing, um, just because as I've gotten to know Anastasia's work, I just keep thinking deeper and deeper about it. And I've always been interested in that cross section of photography and what it tells us about environmentalism and nature and all of the kind of how we, how we interact with our environments. So Anastasia's work is, is very much always been at the forefront of something that I'm interested in inherently. So it's exciting to have this work here and to welcome Anastasia back. Thank you. Yeah, tonight we're going to, um, we have a slide presentation that's gonna take you through a lot of different bodies of Anastasia's work, because I wanna to touch on a lot of the different um, things that she's worked on, not just Flood Zone, but I wanna start with Flood Zone, even though it's not Anastasia's first body of work, um, because that's what's up here at the museum right now, and it's really exciting to have the largest exhibition of that work to date, um, and it was really exciting to get to do something a little different in our galleries. We don't normally have just a single body of work um, and it was wonderful to work with Anastasia on kind of making that happen. And hopefully 
If you've gone through the exhibition, you notice that there's a little bit of a psychological environment being built in there as well. So we can touch on that if you want. But so I thought, Anastasia, we should just start with you moving to Miami in 2016 and coming to this environment that is Miami, um, that is Florida, and what you were discovering as an uh, outsider at that point, and what happened as you became an insider. Um, how did this body of work kind of come into being based on that? Thank you, Jamie. Um, and thank you so much, everybody, for coming and for hosting me here and for, um, for the wonderful exhibition that you designed. Um, there's an entire team I want to thank. I know how much work goes into it. And it, it is my favorite show of this work by far. Um, you know, they all have something special. I think it's its uh, fifth or sixth iteration. And this is the biggest exhibition of this uh, body of work, which is ongoing. Um, uh, I want to point out um, Nick Marshall is here somewhere who put my name in the mix, I think, for exhibition selections uh, and has been a champion of this work early on. Uh, and the work uh, actually for the first time got shown here in my talk in, I think it was 2016, right? 2016? Uh, so I showed some snippets um, with sort of trembling hands, uh, still very unsure of what I was doing. 2016, some of the earliest images from the flood zone. To me, uh, coming from years of studio practice, it was um, lens-based, but it was constructed images of, um, well, constructed still lifes that I would rephotograph that were addressing the subject of um, landscape. Do you, want, do you want me to go forward to that? Oh, and we can come back okay, to that we'll later. Back to I'm just going to drop that. <laughs> My training at the Russian State University for the Humanities was in environmental design and architecture. So I felt uh, for years, and really still do, as an imposter in photography. I only learned photography because I had to photograph the models of my spaces and buildings. And you can see that that probably transfers over in this certain aesthetic that is quite flat, right? So it's like a, a shop window space. For a couple of years, I worked as a shop window decorator <laughs> to pay for my college uh, back there. And then long story short, moving to Miami, years of practice in the, in the studio, assembling my still lifes, and then encountering this world that felt like a collage. You might notice that all the images are quite layered, and this flatness allows me to create this uh, sort of montage-like aesthetic. Um, I am coming from Russia. Um, I am influenced by the Bauhaus and uh, constructivism. Um, those were intertwined at the time. The school where I studied was, you know, my heroes were um, uh, painters, uh, especially women painters of the Russian avant-garde, Natalia Goncharova, Alexandra Exter, Lyubov Popova, um, and then, of course, uh, Hannah Hoch, and so on. So this collage aesthetic uh, is what I'm encountering in Miami in real life. And that's what propels this initial curiosity to document what I was seeing. Um, I studied environmental design, and then I lived uh, in the Midwest for uh, my, during my MFA years and a little after when I was teaching at a community college. Um, but again, my, my practice was in the studio. Um, so everything was assembled and rephotographed and then printed again. Uh, Miami felt like this life scale collage to me. So it was the formal elements of that that drew me in first. And then I started noticing the signs. So 2016 is when I moved. Um, and we had this first hurricane, it um, was called Matthew. They all have cute names, <laughs> like Ian right now. It's destroying the West Coast. Uh, Matthew wasn't too impactful, but the next year we got hit by um, a pretty big one. So it was Category 4, Hurricane Irma. Um, and that's where I, we decided to sit it out with my small family in a, a sort of older condo in Miami Beach. It was a lifelong dream to live by the water. Um, and that one was the, uh, overwhelming. 
um, to say the least, so the howling winds and then assessing the damage the next day, I understood that even though as much of an imposter as I felt, it was immoral for me not to document what I was seeing. And I've, I've never seen anything like that. I know I've lived landlocked my, my whole life, um, but w this was something beyond, and clearly the infrastructure just was not ready for what was coming. Yeah. One of the things I, I really appreciate about your photographic practice is you don't just go in and react to the scene. You then follow it up with a lot of research and finding out about things. I'll just point out quickly, for those of you who might not be as familiar, images like this are actually where she's talking about, like a collaged landscape. This is actually kind of like a billboard on a, on a fence, and then you see the construction happening. So it's masking that construction. Um, so that idea of images within the environment as you're walking through the city um, that you're encountering is a very big part of that kind of collage aspect of Anna's work. Um, so to go back to what I was saying, I, I really appreciate that you do research and that you delve into things. And so even the title Flood Zone came out of your research and, and um, that so much of your work is informed by science and thinking about um, the psychology of being in that space, so climate anxiety. So this project that starts off as a personal diary really turns into something much more meaningful in a broader cultural sense. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the, the research that you found along the way that really um, impacted you and, and kept you going forward as you were also personally facing that climate anxiety? Yeah. Um... So there are a couple of things to address here. Um, I was teaching uh, for about six years full-time and a couple of years part-time. So I was aware of various practitioners in the field already working with the subject, right? With environmentalism, you have Bortinsky right across from this, uh, uh, from this theater, uh, from my show, right? I'm not a photojournalist. I knew what I did not want to do because it's already being done and done well. Um, I wanted to show a perspective of this everyday person walking the streets. I am a parent. Um, I am an insider in that urban landscape, in this environment. So it's the minutia of everyday life that are relatable uh, is what I was after. And those collages of sort of proposed environment of the future uh, Miami is where I live um, and of the current Miami that is sinking right and there's even some past that's woven in so how do you splice all those three together and photography has this um, just precious quality right to be not only art but also this record of this actual you know what's in front of your lens so n none of these images are staged um, these are all observations, but you can see how it's almost a collage already, right? So this is the billboard for um, yet another hotel, and this, it's all implied. I wanted to take on a more metaphorical approach rather than the literal depiction of um, what climate change looks like. You know, even the, the term itself is already a bit overused and kind of stigmatized for that reason. And the last thing I wanted is further division on the issue, right? What I wanted was to perhaps unite the skeptics for a while in Florida. Um, specifically, the term climate change was banned on the governmental level. You couldn't say it to the media. Uh, so it only changed in the recent few years. Um, and, the, you know, reasons are understandable, but... <laughs> <laughs> the development, they, they didn't want to stifle the development, um, but nonetheless quite unethical. Um, so things that I, I was seeing, um, interpreting them in a more poetic way, and at the same time acknowledging that this is a subjective perspective. I am this person, you know, I'm this parent, I'm a woman, I'm walking the streets in the public space, I live there, um, and I am overcome with this tremendous anxiety uh, over what's to come and how to cope and do I need a shelf for hurricane supplies and turns out I do and now I have one and then uh, all the local friends sharing the sentiment and nobody really having any definitive answers to the problem right yeah and 
And um, this work actually bled into a new body of work for you. So as you were starting to face those kind of uh, what I'll call political kind of insights, you know, Florida saying you can't say climate change to the um, to the media. You started to really explore Florida as a, a broader topic, right? Um, is it okay if I zoom forward to the Florida's book? So this year, Anastasia came out. I'm going to zoom forward through a lot of things real quick. Um, just quickly, this is Anastasia's work, Landscape Sublime, that we were talking about at the beginning that was a pre a body of work before um, Flood Zone, where you're actually making collages on a tabletop and, and really thinking about idealized landscapes. Um, so you can kind of see one of those get constructed here. And this is the body of work that Anastasia came and spoke about the last time she was here. The, yeah, and that, one is, that one is ongoing. So this one here is Yosemite. And this was my sort of dreamscape of America. I've not visited before I ended up moving to the United States in 2008. I grew up in Moscow. And my you know, vision understanding of America came from the predictable um, you know, mass media and Hollywood, but also photography books. And so Ansel Adams was a big reference. And then that was the first place they revisited. Yeah. And... and so one of the things I want to get to is you're highly influenced by art and photography. And you, again, you really do your research and you think. And I know we have some students here in the audience. And sometimes when I ask students, like, who are you influenced by? They don't want to tell me or they don't want to, to think about that legacy of photography. And I love that you think about that. Um, and so the Florida's work is really in conversation with um, Oh my God, his name just walked out of my head. We walk Evans, but Walker just Evans. something I wanted to point out here really quickly. Um, when Eliza was introducing me and the line about how my work deals with the picturesque, this is the, what the picturesque refers to, this kind of calendar-like images. So this one is a good case study, uh, six real Matterhorns. So these are images I source from uh, the web, you know, online. I print them out. These are public domain images, so I'm not infringing anybody's copyright. There's so many of the type you can imagine, right, how many times the Matterhorn has been photographed, or rainbows, I have that. Uh, and it's actually seven Matterhorns, and one is from Disneyland, the one at the very top, <laughs> which was created. You know, the whole thing was reassembled from the images of the Matterhorn. But the next slide, uh, there's uh, in the next slide, this is the Biennale. This is in the issue that's currently, uh, it's been republished, and it's on view at uh, the Museum of Modern Art in New York with Wolfgang Tillman's show. So it's reproduced right there, and I was so excited to see it there. Uh, these were the newer sublimes, so inspired by Citroen, Paul Citroen's montage uh, called Metropolis, and I'm obsessed with places and spaces and cities. It's the architect in me that never <laughs> came to, to fruition. So these are uh, images of essentially um, just witnesses of uh, environmental um, disasters in the states of the recent years, uploading their images to Flickr and all kinds of other social media that I would print out and then reassemble into these compositions. So it's sort of cubism in photographic form. Um, this is probably the most direct reference. Uh, did you know that New York City w has been rezoned into a subtropical zone as of 2019? there's a New York Times article on the subject. And so this was inspired by that shocking news. And it's an ongoing project. I do public art things with that. This is the project you're referring to. The yeah, so this is the book that I was referring to where her, uh, Anna's work is really in conversation with Walker Evans's work. I don't know how that um, escaped my head, uh, but it did. Um, and so this was really exploring Florida more as a concept and all the types that you find and um, kind of the things along the way. Can you talk about how this grew out of Flood Zone and, yeah. and kind of the exploration that you did to, to make these work? Yeah, and like you said, Jamie, um, it, it did start on the conceptual level for me again. So it's concept research um, and, then, um, it, and then different approaches at visualizing those two. Um, Understanding, I think on a deeper level, that climate change is not some kind of separate 
uh, phenomenon. We cannot separate climate change um, from the, the history of exploited land and labor, from politics, from the current economic situation, right? From how things operate on a larger level. It's not a separate um, concept. There's a term, um, um, I think it's called hyper concept, it's just hyper object something that's so beyond, and my work prior dealt with the, um, the category of the sublime, you know, the picturesque, the beautiful, and then the sublime. Um, the whole philosophy, right? Kant and Schopenhauer and those aesthetic categories, what sublime signifies. So this is something so beyond that it can take over, right? Uh, or beyond our comprehension. Yeah, your brain can't even imagine yes. something so amazing, essentially, like walking into Yosemite for the first time or seeing the Grand Canyon. For yeah, the first and time. not always with a positive connotation either. So the sublime in this case, you know, going through, uh, living through that hurricane of Category 4 was the sublime experience. This is Mexico Beach on the, um, in, um, uh, on the forgotten coast of Florida, Gulf Coast um, North. Uh, and this was destroyed in 2018, and it was very well-built community. This was the only house that survived. All of these are empty lots that are still there. And when I was standing and photographing, there was a, a group of developers that were coming through, and I asked them. They were all wearing these really expensive watches. <laughs> and, so, and I'm standing there with my camera. Um, I asked uh, what they were doing, and they said, now is the time to invest. Nobody believes there's going to be another big one, and we only need 10 years to profit from, from all of that land. Um, this is this beautiful Vizcaya state. So again, there are themes, there are environmental themes within the Florida's book, but I wanted to expand on, on other subjects too. And again, you know, this is a subjective perspective. And that's why Florida's multiple, so it refers to multiple, Florida, multiple Florida's within the state. It's so divided, right? It's a swing state politically. Um, you go there to either escape or reinvent yourself. Um, and of course, now we have the, the looming disaster that is DeSantis. Um, so all of that anxiety, again, <laughs> was channeled into a series of road trips. Actually, the first exhibition I saw when I moved to Miami was Berenice Abbott Route 1, and it got me thinking of how little uh, women are um, engaged in the genre of um, you know, this Grand Americana road trip photography, uh, location photography. So I wanted to start with Florida. Um, there's another gator I had to. This is a, a happier one. It's a farm, though. Um, but this project ultimately spanned the beyond Florida, right? So you started to also look at Georgia and other states and that same kind of how that concept of Florida bleeds into other spaces as well. Uh, that was with the flood zone. Yes, flood zone has four states. The Florida is just Florida. And then while I was on the West Coast, the one that's being impacted by Ian, um, Hurricane Ian right now, I discovered this archive by Walker Evans. And this book as well was edited, oh yes, guns, uh, was edited by uh, curator and writer David Campany. Um, we collaborated on the flood zone book and he's an expert on Walker Evans. So he helped, um, find some incredible gems from the Metropolitan Museum of Art collection. Um, it turned out that Evans photographed in Florida for over 40 years, and that work has barely ever been published and seen. Some of those images have never been reproduced because they were negatives. Uh, I had to do quite a bit of touch-ups <laughs> on some of those negatives. Um, and then he painted there, too, uh, wonderful um, gouaches and temperas. Um, in a very Evans kind of style, if you can define that in painting, or you can translate it into painting, it does translate. There's certain minimalism, and I relate it to so much in his um, formal approach. It's really all about the subject, it's about the framing. There's very little photographic shtick, you know, barely any dramatic shadow, there's no sensationalism. It's all about the subject, it's about this road that ends, you know, even though there are already sold lots over here. Um, so it's my take on Florida, but I'm, I'm looking at Florida as a representation of perhaps uh, America as a whole. So then um, I want to get to your current body of work, which is Image Cities. Um, so throughout COVID, Anastasia has been tra traveling all over the world to metropolises. Um, 
good timing uh and um and kind of getting back to that idea of like what does consumerism and the built environment look like and um i love kind of the again that collage aesthetic but you know that it's real people and and how um you're approaching these spaces i wonder um what i know this is new body of work for you and it's still very fresh but I wonder what insights you've found as you've traveled to these different metropolises. Is there something that ties all of it together? And as, are there insights, depending upon the cultures that you're within, that really um, change things? Thank you, Jamie. If you could go to a previous couple of slides. <laughs> Since this is a new body of work, um, I'm having a flashback to my first talk here at the Eastman Museum, where prior to that, I'm an English second language person and a first generation immigrant. <laughs> so um, prior to that talk in 2016, most of my um, public talks were scripted. This was the first attempt in a non-scripted talk, and I remember it was so short for uh, vocabulary when trying to articulate the flood zone project, and it still felt very abstract, you know, when you're really in the middle of something. Uh, you're still formulating your, your take on it. And this was that year of speculative shooting that I was doing, but I, I felt the urgency to do it. So now with the image cities, it's a very similar thing. And this is, I want to acknowledge the Fundacion Mapfre, because when uh, some friends see me on social media and comment, oh, you're traveling to all of those places, like it's all funded. <laughs> None of it is traveling. This is all work. And this is this award that I got last year. So interestingly, you know, my Florida and flood zone work uh, got published in Germany by Steidel, uh, the legendary, you know, Göttingen-based publisher. And then this one will be uh, published by Fundacion Mapfre in Spain and exhibited in Barcelona and in Madrid. Uh, so that's what funded the project. My proposal began um, with New York City and Moscow, where I'm from. Uh, which I visited uh, in the summer of 2021 for a biennial. I'll, I'll get back to that later um, after I've not been there for over a decade. So you can see here again this collage aesthetic, but nothing is staged. It's all reflections. So think about maybe Lee Friedlander, Solo Leiter, uh, were my references and many others. These are all reflections of posters that are printed that we see all throughout different cities. Um, and I based it again on research uh, for global network of these major metropolises. Um, this is London. I love that the people are getting stepped on quite literally or pushed away by the poster in this yes, case. Yes, that important detail in the, in the lower corner. And just like with the flood zone, none of my work is meant to provide any answers. Uh, the goal is to ask uh, questions. I think they're on my mind. Uh, and living in Miami and um, sometimes in New York City, you wonder um, what's the demographic that those cities of the future that you see in the real estate billboards and endless advertising, what's the demographic that they're aiming to serve? You know, who can really stay in those cities? Uh, what was the demographic that built the cities? And who's going to be able to stay? Um, so climate gentrification is a big problem in Miami, and I've addressed that in the flood zone work and even in the Floridas. And then here, this is a much broader geography. Uh, so it's 17 city, cities globally in this project. It was an incredibly intense year. I did it all in the year <laughs> post-COVID. I think it was compensating for my isolation prior. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and you can see how it's a, it's a number of things that, that is being addressed here. Um, so the kind of real estate development that's happening um, this one almost looks like a Martha Rossler collage, I thought. Um, this is in is that Madrid and uh, Mona Lisa in, in the back. So it's like high culture, low culture, um, the cities of the future, cities holding on to their cultural identity, the cultures that made the cities, and now they're be becoming increasingly sort of homogenous um, in the kind of people they can accommodate. Um, and the kind of architecture that gets approved based on those renderings. Uh, last summer, uh, the project was in part inspired by Jacques Tati's Playtime 
if uh, some of you I'm sure know the, and if, for the first time I saw it on the big screen and there's this tourism bureau um, in, in one of the scenes where Paris and in Berlin and Tokyo were starting to look exactly the same as this Mies van der Rohe type of architecture. So it's sort of glass and metal. This is a prop from Los Angeles. And each one is unique. Um, there are these people that run out, the workers that run out to the traffic um, on the road to show new developments and to sort of entice people to... So they're literally taking the billboard into, exactly. this, into yeah. the street yeah. while people are stopped. Yes, and yeah. as always, the work you know here very literally looks at it's like a zoomed-in version of images within um, our environment. They're so just ever-present, right? I, I want to return to your background as um, like an environmental architect, essentially, um, and how that now plays in your work in the built environment. Because I think your observations and the way you see the space around you is so unique. Um, so, so when you're in a space, what are you looking for? What, are, what draws your eye? How do you know um, where your framing is coming from? And, and narrow down that like vast possibility of New York City to images. Uh, it's a lot of walking uh, and chance, right? There is some research. Um, I love the book Feminist City by um, Leslie Kern. And then, uh, so that one got me thinking how, yes, historically cities were built by men and predominantly for men, right? Apart from little playgrounds for, for women with maybe occasional restroom, uh, which could be a separate chapter <laughs> in my book. Um, and then uh, Flaneuse by Lauren Elkin, uh, the concept of, you know, a man, a male flaneur getting inspired by this public space, you know, urban environment, and then uh, channeling that into some high art, poetry, right, painting. Uh, and uh, again, there's this gender division in the concept itself. Uh, a woman in the public space for a long time was this street woman, right? Um, even now, there's quite a bit of attention and visibility. It's different kind of perception, right, of woman flaneuring. Um, so those were the two points of reference for me. And then, of course, One Way Street by Walter Benjamin. Um, many others later, but those were the key ones. What I look for, I think it's in the, the key word is image. Um, and so how images within those urban landscapes um, signify our aspirations, values, and again, they help show the potential trajectory of that place, you know, the past, the present, and the future together. Um, this is a reflection. I think I, I dropped in a painting again to remind you of the cubist aesthetic <laughs> of the constructivist, yeah, painters in Moscow. Uh, once you've framed a vantage, I'm going to call it a vantage. Um, how, how many tries do you give it? Because a lot of the impact of this work is the fact that somebody's shadow plays into it, somebody's foot enters into it, um, that that's the contrast of the individual within the street scene um, who probably is passing by this thing every day on their way to work or some, you can imagine that narrative, right? So how many tries do you give an image before you know that you've got it? Or, you know, is it like you're waiting and waiting and you, you get the image and you walk away? Yeah, there is a bit of decisive moment involved, for sure. Um, actually, even with the Florida's work, I showed two separate images by Evans of the same exact scene, but there was a slight movement uh, of workers and he was a notorious cropper, um, and he would wait and reshoot. So it takes um, at least a dozen um, attempts to get the right one, and then sometimes I wait for the right movement, for the right figure. It's usually a figure in landscape. There are very few portraits you can see. Um, and sometimes it's just the right, the right, you know, gaze. The right contrast of colors yeah. in this case, right? And the, I, the, it's just witty, right? There's like a wit to your work that, um, that like it's arresting. You stop, you have to really think about all the layers and how they're interacting with each other. Um, and I, I really appreciate that about your work because it, it 
makes you stop and think about your relationship to the environment yourself, right? And how it is that you relate to the street that you might walk down every day. Um, and what it is that consumerism is trying to do to you as you're walking down the street. Um, there is a definite play in that sense. Yeah, this is 2021, so this is pre-war, but it was ominous already. Uh, and this is actually what inspired my project. I saw signs of something impending, and this was June 2021. This is Paris. This is one, um, the opera building. So actual architecture, rendering of architecture, and this phone, and it's a single shot. And so when you just start paying attention, sort of zoom in, um, photography for me is a very meditative and solitary process. It, it does require hours of walking and observing. I am this observer and flaneuse. Um, and like you said, there is the wittiness, there is a bit of humor as a kind of coping mechanism, like a darker humor. It's certainly there. They can't be taken at face value. You know, there's just a bit of a flip. But on the scale of, say, Martin Parr humor, I'm, I'm in a sort of a darker <laughs> side of that. Sometimes I watch out for a scene and think, oh, and I admire his work too. But. Yeah, there's a definite, like, um, Alfred Hitchcock yeah. psychology, right? That, like, there's always something in, in your work that's playing in the back of my head that's uh, it's ominous, right? It's you're waiting for the shoe to fall and kind of, I don't know, do something that's not so good. Um, I love that reference. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I will adopt that. There's something beneath the surface. There's something lurking. You know, there's something's not quite right, right? That That's... Yeah, and, and in some cases it might be an alligator. In some cases it might be consumerism. In some cases, like the... Um, this is the garage of my building, by the way, and this yeah. is my son after Hurricane Irma, so that's the next day, and he's wearing a bike helmet. So there are several images in the book as us biking around in the neighborhood and assessing what was going on. Yeah, and really like facing that initial impact of being in a hurricane situation. And, and I think that that sense of climate anxiety that you feel comes through in the work. Um, and again, I just really appreciate that about the work. Yeah. I, um, I do want to open it up to questions at this point and um, give anybody who has a, a question for Anastasia an opportunity. Um, we are, again, going to be doing a book signing after this, so um, please come down if you have further questions after this and talk to Anastasia down in the Potter Pear style outside the exhibition. Um, I also want to point out that our moving image department has made a series of three films related to this body of work, um, the first of which is tonight. Um, so if you're sticking around at 7.30, there's a, a film this evening that kind of addresses climate change um, in moving image um, kind of cinema works. And the next two Thursdays will also have films. So um, something to look out for if this is a subject matter that's particularly of interest to you. If you have a question, raise your hand and Eliza will come around to you. I can repeat questions. Anyone have a question? This is the perpetual, oh, there's one over here, yeah. Great question. <laughs> I did, actually. My flight was supposed to be today, so speaking of um, becoming a hardened experienced Floridian. <laughs> um, I have uh, several trackers, hurricane trackers, and when we found out that something was moving our way through Cuba, I was monitoring because it can sway east or west. Um, I was supposed to fly in today, and then I changed my flight for Tuesday, and then I got, I was able to get the last seat. On Monday morning, I saw that it was shifting and now it's part intuition, part trackers, but certainly intuition <laughs> where it's going. And yes, yeah, certainly the flights were all um, yeah, halted for until Friday. Schools were closed, even on the East Coast where I am. Um, you know, something to point out when we think again, climate change, oh, Florida kind of deserves it anyways. <laughs> In a way, I agree. <laughs> 
<laughs> I always share images from the 20s from Florida. Maybe you should just go back to that state when it was just tents and cars pulled up by the beach. And it was never meant to be for this full-time living in concrete all over the streets, you know, in skyscrapers. It's bizarre, and I'm trying to address that too, and the irony that I live there for now. Um, but it's going to affect everybody. You know, as of recently, I think a couple years ago, um, Buffalo proclaimed themselves the, the capital for climate migration in the area. And we're seeing impacts of that in the South as well. You know, now Atlanta can barely take any more people. They're running out of fresh water. So they're salinating all these reservoirs in the northern Florida, for instance. And there's an entire community that I photographed in, um, in the Florida's book. Uh, Apalachicola that was dependent on oyster fishing and was supplying this enormous uh, percentage of oysters in the in the region um, is, is going defunct and bankrupt so all of those families are going to be out of work because there's a ban for five years on oyster fishing in the area um, oyster harvesting because it, it's so salinated uh, to supply fresh water for Atlanta so it's all so connected and that's just one example, right? And now, of course, because of climate change, hurricanes are getting a lot stronger and they're getting a lot higher up the Atlantic coast, which is all vulnerable, right? You had the entire community in New Jersey that had to be relocated. So sorry, it's a very extended <laughs> answer to your question. But um, yeah, it's, it's going to affect all of us. And I'll also point out quickly that um, we worked with Anastasia to pick images from our collection that are historic images of floods, um, and that kind of concludes the exhibition as a, I, I like to think of it as a coda, because it's like, now you've been through the current situation. This is ongoing, right? This isn't new. And it actually affects our, our Rochester community, if you look at Lake Ontario and kind of the balance of um, how water is, is there and what's happening along that coast. Um, all of this is impacting us, so it's something we should all be paying attention to. Is there anyone else that has a question in the audience? Go ahead and I'll, I'll, um, I'll repeat your question. So the question is, have, have you been to the Everglades? Of course, yeah. Do I expand? <laughs> yeah. What's what was your uh, in, what was your impression of the Everglades and kind of the when I, when I flew into Miami to go and meet with Anastasia, I was like shocked at how Miami is just like right there next to the Everglades. There's a road, and there's some like mining, and then there's the Everglades. And this this idea that we've just like cut a line in the sand in a way, but in this case, in the Everglades. Um, yeah, how's and it, how's it it's in terms of the Everglades, the, the number one thing I think, I think about um, in terms of the Everglades is um, some of my friends um, behind the foundation called Love the Everglades. It's a Miccosukee tribe, and we did a panel around this show. Really, the point of this work is to generate this dialogue, you know, where... Um, I could talk to people, I'm being affected in a direct way, and then there, but there's a much broader community, right? So the Mikosuke tribe that was sort of pushed into the Everglades in the wetlands that was not their choice to live there, but historically they ended up there. Um, <clears throat> and now the, the struggle for um, unpolluted, for clean water is what's happening, all the agricultural runoff. Uh, there's an image in the Florida's book um, of this defunct hotel. Um, it was an abandoned for environmental reasons. It was actually all those canals were dug up in the Everglades. It was called Port of the Everglades um, that immediately uh, polluted that entire uh, area. And it was just an environmental disaster. And it was a huge operation. There were uh, separate, there was a separate airline. There were private jets of um, wealthy Midwesterners being flown into the Everglades, into that hotel, um, to entice them to acquire properties that were getting developed in the Everglades at the time. So that's my take on the Everglades. It's wonderful. I fed an alligator a marshmallow there. You can do that. <laughs> There's an image from the Everglades in the in the Florida's book and in the in the flood zone book. But it's it's tricky because now the, the tribes are, are stuck there with horrible water. 
Well, one thing maybe you can look at, in, 19, in the 1940s, they drilled for oil in the Everglades. They found it. It was too sulfurous, so they let the lease go. And Harry Truman made it a park. So it was disgusting how um, oil was found in the Everglades, and, and the result of that was making it into a park. Yeah, have you looked at all into the red tide on the Gulf Coast and phosphate mines that are aggravating and just south of Tampa? Yes. Can you, can you um, repeat the question just a little bit? The, the have I looked at the agricultural runoff and the algae blooms? And phosphate mines, there is a photograph of phosphate mines. Um, just as you land, actually we have some too in the uh, in the airport area. Um, Sweetwater, as you land into Miami International, you can see those um, really artificially colored lakes. Uh, so those mines are in the background and then there's this mysterious um, square lake of uh, bright emerald color, um, the purpose of which I'm uncertain of. Uh, it was actually an editorial assignment for me. That's how I was able to get the helicopter. Um, and uh, on the other side of the image here, like where we are with Jamie right now, there are all these new real estate developments. So these are um, communities that are being built, uh, residential homes, yeah, single family homes. Uh, so this could be clearing the space for one of those. I live on that street. It's a, yeah, it's on my block. Um, I'm, I'm. It's still very difficult to talk about it. Um, it's, it's, it's literally my community. Uh, it's rebar, and uh, now my condo that was built in the same real estate boom, which is the second condo because I moved from the one that had the flooded garage. Um, we found a bunch of exposed rebar as well and there were several condos that were um, there was the mandatory evacuation without really any plan to accommodate the people um, I think about four entire condominiums were relocated not relocated just closed uh, because they found so many flaws um, but yeah surfside collapse um, it um, the, the ripple effect of that was um, increased inspections at all the buildings, which I'm grateful for. Um, and there, there are a lot of renovations that are happening right now. But of course, what do you do? I've seen the seawalls collapse, and there's still all this skepticism about mangroves, which are a much better barrier, actually. Um, yeah, it's, it's complicated, but there's work being done on uh, a restoration on uh, a number of residential condos now. I'm interested in your observation process and especially the way you, you look at um, the architecture and the commercial images that are in the scene and that people invade that scene and become part of that scene. How do you deal with that? Do you find something that you want know, to photograph or do you think or do you know that's going to make a good photograph? Just a way to the decisive moment that you talked about. Um, and where does the commercialism come into all of this? Is that a priority in the work or not? Yeah. Um Ah, okay, so the, there were only two images of Moscow, but that was a, a rather extensive um, time that I spent there. And then growing up in Soviet Russia, I am acutely, um, I think, aware of any propagandistic message that I might be getting through images specifically, because uh, they affect us on such immediate level. You know, uh, words mediate, but there's a bit more filter. You know, there's a pause. You can choose not to read if it's something 
rather large, right? With images, they uh, they embed themselves into our memory and into our collective memory without us noticing sometimes. And that's why, you know, this um, the scale of enormous images and smaller figures navigating the space is again an allegory of this ever-present image that's sort of hovering there's the like overlords, you know, there's these eyes that are looking at this corporate agenda, sort of consume, buy, achieve, you know, aspire to this. And uh, when I was growing up, um, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union in 91 was a collapse of, in representation, you know, all the ideals just crushed uh, and replaced by something different uh, that we had to adapt to. And even that turned out to be... Um, false as well, you know, in the glimmer of democracy that we got for a very brief period of time. Um, so analyzing the images critically and always sort of prodding beneath the surface of what is being presented through the image and then maybe seeking patterns in the multiples um, and what those patterns um, how, how they affect our thinking and perception of the world um, and our choices um, and our aspirations. And that's what I'm looking at with, uh, with the Image Studies Project. It's very, um, I, I want it to be diverse and not, you know, these are fairly wealthy cities. They're, for the most part, um, capitals. And again, they're based on this list of cities that are most globally connected and they affect the most in the world. So the most powerful cities in the world. Uh, and there's a list, and there's a really funny terminology. Uh, it's quite masculine, too. Uh, it's alpha plus plus city, alpha plus alpha, and then beta cities. So <laughs> alpha plus plus is uh, it's a tie between New York City and London. And then the alpha plus is like Paris and, and so on. Um, yeah, so there's a number of layers. And as with the flood zone work and the Florida's work, um, the accompanying essay will be very open. Um, I'm curious to see what you know an architect would see in this. Um, I have um, a friend who is a PhD in urban development, you know, and then what an image maker will see in those. And of course, the subject of those images in urban spaces, it's, it has such a history from Ajay, right, and Evans and Levitt and there's a whole lineage of people who are already um, looking at how, yeah, how these images surround us on a daily basis. And a lot of the people in the Image Cities Project actually are on their phone as well. So it's like doubling, <laughs> double down on the image intake. Uh, yeah. I think we have time for one more question. So we'll go over here. So, so one of my favorite images in the show is been projecting here, which is the one with the hands holding the cup in front of the building. Could you just talk a bit about what, I don't know, it's not this one. Um, I don't know. Go ahead and ask your question, and, and I'll find out. So I'm just curious what, what you're, you're saying in, in that particular image, and also I was curious about the technique. There. I think it's the graffiti image. Was that the graffiti one? Oh, it was on the right. The hand with the cup oh, and the graffiti. Great, thank you. It's uh, usually not paid much attention to, so I'm glad. They're the, they're the popular 15, and then there's the rest. Uh, so this graffiti is, and again, it's subjective. I live um, in, a, in a different neighborhood, but I've my artist residency was not too far from here. And I noticed this is one of those areas, it's bordering Little Haiti, um, this neighborhood um, that is now being rapidly gentrified because it's an elevated inland position. So it's about 14 to 17 feet above um, sea level versus Miami Beach, three to four feet. And this is the most lucrative real estate right now. And, uh, you know, graffiti, 
used to be the sort of underground right, rebellious act, but now it's actually, uh, if, if some of you ever visit Miami, you would hear about the Wynwood District. It's all very sanctioned and uh, commissioned and uh, very well paid type of graffiti. So actually what developers would do, they would invite graffiti artists <laughs> to uh, you know, beautify the streets. And then it's almost now a sure sign of impending development that will not accommodate for the current demographic of those neighborhoods. Uh, it's it's like a yeah it's like a predictable sign that this development is getting that, that this neighborhood is getting redeveloped and this is the fate of uh, Little Haiti currently. Yeah, so it's about that. You know, it's just yeah, it's the hand pouring water. I have my own meaning being an insider, but it's also there for. Um, it's formal elements, you know, and it, it fits within the theme. And this is this wonderful uh, clothing designer. The dog is actually plastic, and it's a barber shop in Miami. Um, and it's a total, you know, happenstance. She was walking by. I noticed my favorite color, and I compliment the dress. And then she does this Venus pose for me on her own. And she was shopping for fabrics, and she's, yeah. And very ache, like there's a... A guy back here with a Miami hat on, like Miami is peering in watching this whole scene happen with the fake yeah. dog and, uh, you know, like the the luxury and the life that you want, but it's all kind of a facade. Um, so, so yeah. yeah. Well, she was, she invited me to her fashion show that day and yeah, all the images are approved, you know, I, I don't shoot paparazzi style, there's a rapport with all the people. Yeah. So thank you again for coming back and um, being here. And thanks to all of you for coming and listening to our conversation tonight. Um, again, I invite you to come down to the Peristyle and, and um, speak with Anastasia in person and have a book signed and um, enjoy the work again now that you know a little bit more about it and where uh, it's taken Anastasia into new bodies of work. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Jamie.